Hello, everybody. Uh, I may introduce uh, myself shortly. My name is Pierre Aumont from France. I am a CLL patient uh, still in uh, Watch and Wait. I am also a patient, patient advocate uh, in France with uh, ELI, in Europe with uh, the network uh, Eurobloodnet, and uh, at the global level with the CLL Advocate Network. Uh, I am uh, vice, vice chair of the steering committee, and CLAN, of course, is hosting this, uh, this, uh, this Horizon uh, 21 meeting. Uh, I hope you had a very interesting uh, first day. We had uh, uh, well brilliant uh, uh, presentation and in-depth uh, discussions. I hope of also that uh, this day, the day two, will be uh, as interesting and uh, we will try to make it uh, as uh, useful as possible. Uh, no need to explain why uh, the steering committee and Nick, the chairman of this uh, committee, uh, decided to uh, dedicate, uh, well, half a day uh, <clears throat> on uh, the COVID uh, pandemic and its uh, consequences on uh, the CLL uh, community and CLL patients. No need also to uh, explain why we uh, organized a shared session with clinician and patient advocates, because we are uh, learning uh, every day from this uh, quite new uh, virus, uh, two years old, and it is important that the exchanges uh, between the clinicians and the, the patient advocates uh, occur in order to help everybody, both the clinicians and the patient advocates to, to cope with this uh, very uh, difficult uh, situation. So we, we will have a, a, a first session on COVID, uh, which is divided in three parts. First part, you will hear uh, two lectures from two uh, well-known clinicians, and then we will have a Q&A session with those two clinicians. And after that, we will have a panel uh, composed of uh, the two clinicians and three uh, also well-known patient advocates uh, I will uh, introduce uh, later on. Let me now introduce the two uh, clinicians uh, uh, in order of appearance, uh, Dr. Renat Renata Walewska, uh, who is consultant hematologist at the Royal Bournemouth Hospital in the UK, and uh, also uh, chairing the UK CLL Forum. And she is uh, uh, un, uh, un, uh, also uh, trying to establish uh, new guidelines about uh, CLL. And then, uh, uh, well, Dr. Walewska will present uh, the whole landscape, uh, let's say COVID and CLL. And uh, after that, we will have a, a lecture uh, from uh, Pro Professor Florence Simbalista. She is a hematologist and a CLL specialist uh, in, uh, at uh, Avicenne Hospital in Bobigny, that is close to Paris and she is actively involved in research, in research regarding CLL and clinical, trial, clinical trials uh, uh, about uh, novel drugs. So, uh, Dr. Walewska, uh, and after that, uh, Professor Simbalista, the floor is yours. Hello, thank you for inviting me to talk at this conference. I will be talking about COVID-19 and CLL, the data. And what do we actually know today? Um, the point of this presentation, really, we don't know that much. We're full of retrospective data, but I'll try to um, tell you the most important message we know so far. These are my disclosures. So throughout my presentation, for the next 15 minutes, I'll tell you about outcomes um, in CLL patients who have COVID-19, approved treatments for COVID-19, how COVID-19 changed our clinical practice. Um, also, I present um, the experience survey 
for UK CLL patients. We ran together with, um, as a free charities, um, looking at a CLL support association and UK CLL forum, um, addressing challenges facing CLL patients and how can we support you, the patients, moving forward. So let's go through the outcomes in CLL patients. So we knew for a number of years um, that patients with CLL, regardless of their stage, there is a problem in, in immunosuppression. And this immunodeficiency obviously transfers the higher risk for severe COVID-19 infection and hospitalization. And we don't really um, although there were loads of data sets being published, loads of retrospective data, as I mentioned, alluded right at the beginning, we don't really have reliable data to estimate true relative risk compared to age um, sex matched controls. So one of the earlier studies, so this is um, the Italian group, which quoted um, uh, over 30% mortality in sim uh, symptomatic COVID-19 patients. These were patients hospitalized and that compared to 25.5 mortality with those without CLL with um, aged matched. Um, then we had a multi-center study led by um, Dr. Tony Mater where again they repeated mortality of 33% and in this study um, it didn't really matter whether patients were on treatment or off treatment. So, so regardless of the treatment, the mortality stayed the same. From the same group, but this one was a single center cohort study looking at um, actually broader spectrum. So of course the earlier data showing mainly hospitalized patients. So if somebody has got COVID-19 and gets admitted to hospital, that, that's usually 30% um, mortality. But there is a huge um, dearth of patients who are actually not that unwell with COVID and remain um, at home. And we have not managed to capture those patients. So the, the mortality in this, center, in this um, study was much lower, 13%. But what it did show that seroconversion, so it means acquiring immunity against COVID-19, was far lower um, in patients with CLL versus matched controls, and especially in those patients who's got really low immunoglobulin levels. So as I mentioned, there is a um, large number of retrospective um, studies um, kind of showing the same. But this is what I wanted to show you is meta-analysis. So um, researchers basically put number of studies together and try to get a one message um, from all these studies. So they, basically they collected data from well over 3,000 patients from three continents. And this is for hematological malignancy, not just CLL, but study including CLLs were included. And these are the key messages um, from the, that meta-analysis. So first, uh, patients with adult malignancy, um, they had, as I mentioned earlier, so that's kind of, again, conferring that 30% risk of death, but these are usually hospitalized patients. In comparison with um, children, children, there's only 4% of death. And probably that's why uh, COVID-19 has got such a high morbidity in a higher patient. So because the children obviously pushing that um, age difference. Second thing, um, which, which I already alluded to, that is really regardless of treatment, that, um, that the risk is very similar. Uh, we already know that patients from non-white population have got higher mortality. Um, and what, what is probably really important message that most patients um, with hematological malignancy and COVID will survive. So what do we know the outcomes of approved treatment? So really bottom line is we do not have proper treatment for COVID-19. We know about dexamethasone, of course, from recovered trial, but in CLL, there is no data whether it actually improves um, treatment for those patients, specifically with CLL. 
And obviously now um, there is Ronapriv approved, which is a mixture of monoclonal antibody for those patients who's got um, S spike protein. But this is only currently available um, for patients who are hospitalized and reduces 28 day mortality by one fifth. And what is important to add that obviously age and general fitness also impacts COVID-19 related mortality. I'm not covering vaccinations. That will be covered by my next, um, the speaker who follows me, Professor Florence Simbalista. So how the treatment for CLL have been affected during pandemic. So as a UK CLL forum, we are charity for clinicians to advise clinicians and other healthcare providers. We've been issuing, and you can see, or you can check on our, on our forum website, the most updated practical guide of managing CLL. And the main message is one, to delay any treatment. Two, if you do need to treat, use the treatment which is easy to administer and easy to administer outside the hospital. So to avoid attendances and admissions to hospitals, at all costs, avoid chemoimmunotherapy because the most important thing, you want to choose the medication or your, your doctor needs to choose the medication, um, which does not affect um, your immunity. And, there, and I will be repeating that again, and primary way to manage the patients who do need treatment is to prevent any infections, to, also to prevent any admissions to hospital. And how the hospital uh, work has changed. So um, this is a publication from Getting It Right First Time. So this is collaboration from NHS and other colleges trying to streamline how is the best caring for COVID-19 cases. And of course, at the moment, we're seeing a huge increase, especially in UK number of COVID cases. So the first thing in the hospital for us is infection prevention and control of this infection. So test, test, test for um, COVID all the time. So we, we've got regular staff, has got regular PCR testing and isolation and exclusion and working from home um, when somebody needs to isolate is a common occurrence. Um, also, if the patients, so when all those patients who entering hospitals are isolated in a specific ward. So it, previously, if somebody, if we had a flu patient, we would have isolated them within cubicles, within separate rooms. Now within COVID, we actually have got separate wards when we isolate um, patients. Uh, so they, there's a specifically designed area within hospital, you just don't get them in. So the key thing is if you keep testing, that testing needs to obviously be timely. Keep, um, we've got communications uh, really stepped up and we've got especially emergency cards for COVID-19 so we can act um, very quickly. So things truly have changed and it's all about, as I said, testing, prevention and isolating. So cohorting those patients in a, in a safe area of hospitals. So moving on to the last part of my talk, it's about I just want to present the survey. So looking how patients experience throughout the pandemic, obviously with the pandemic hasn't finished, pandemic carries on. So it was a very, it's very important um, snapshot of what we had done. So of course, um, I'm, I'm presenting this from, from the UK perspective. Um, so the first cases in, in COVID-19 in UK were er, in early March, March, and then from March 2020, we had three lockdowns. And during those lockdowns, patients were told to isolate, to shield. Initially, we didn't know what shielding really meant. So basically lock yourself in hospital at home and, and don't get out, which obviously meant that the treatment um, and clinical input have been interrupted. So there was a huge anxiety. Um, so um, the obviously the um, patient support charities were very concerned about patients' well-being. Um, and of course, the healthcare was um, stretched. We clinicians were truly overwhelmed with work. So this was try, trying to pull all the resources together and help inform patients and reassure them. Um, so we ran altogether six surveys. So 
uh, first three surveys were about impact and coping from the start, especially during lockdown. The fourth surveys were changing attitude during lockdown, um, especially with during second lockdown. The fifth survey was about um, unlocking and vaccination. Uh, and the sixth one was a clinician survey looking at the admitting patients. So let's look at the data. So the spread, you can see the, the graph below shows the age representation. So essentially, it's, it, it is representative of CLL population, but you may notice that the vast majority, um, obviously this is well uh, dedicated patients who wanted to um, help us and help themselves. Vast majority were shielding, so the isolating, um, and was a uh, male female ratio was one to one, and 95% of those patients were white. Although the CLL is a retired, usually retired population, but we still saw over 30% of patients were still working. And obviously comorbidities play a very important role, and this is breakdown of these comorbidities. So the male show mental well-being. Well, the vast majority of patients coped really well. As you can see, about approximately 19% um, uh, of these patients um, struggled and, and some of them came out of lockdown, uh, shielding because they scrub, uh, struggled with the mental well-being. What about CLL treatment? So as you can see, 22.7% were due to start the treatment. And... Um, so those patients, um, vast majority of patients became telephone clinics, sort of 88%. And 24% um, of those patients felt they were progressed, but only 16 started the treatment. Um, as you can, uh, you can see, the vast majority were given bruton tyrosine kinase inhibitor. Um, and only 2.3% got chemoimmunotherapy, which I was surprised by because in my practice, I have not given any of these patients chemoimmunotherapy. So what did it look like the COVID-19 in our surveyed patients versus clinician survey? So as you can see, huge majority of those patients were shielding and hence we only saw a um, small number of COVID, whereas the patients which reported by clinicians, um, you can see only 42% shielded. And we have seen quite a significant number of mortality, so higher than the reported 42%. But these are hospitalized patients and they were quite unwell. And obviously comorbidity was quite high and hypogammaglobulinemia was quite high as well. And the uh, fifth survey, last survey was about vaccination. And you can see it was overwhelming um, take on vaccinations. Only a handful of patients had reservations. But despite vaccination, as you can see, 48% decided to shield still. So conclusion. So what we've seen that multi-agency um, work together, together with healthcare, healthcare provider can work really well. Of course, we had a very good, committed group of patients. So um, um, so probably will not re reflect um, all the patients, especially the ones who are not keen to participate with the survey. We can say from that survey that shielding and, and social isolation really works and is the best tool against COVID. Um, and the patients tolerated shielding quite well. Obviously, hypogammaglobulinemia and other health problems um, can impact how patients um, uh, under, uh, goes through COVID. Um, the other important thing that obviously we, th those questions were timely and we changed the questions as the time went along. So unfortunately, because of that, because we wanted to get snapshot and actually act on it, um, we can't have a statistical, a meaningful statistical ana analysis. Um, but I think what it shows that together charities and uh, clinicians, we can work really well. So what is support going forward? So role of clinicians are, Again, I can't repeat enough, prevention is the best cure, essentially. So all patients should be vaccinated, especially from pneumococcus, flu vaccine and COVID vaccines. Any patients who are at risk needs to have a prophylactic antibiotics. Patient with PJP risk needs to have a prophylactic PJP prophylaxis. Patients with hypogammaglobulinemia needs to have prophylactic. If they fail that, they need to have immunoglobulin replacement therapy. 
as I mentioned, annual vaccination and COVID vaccination for immediate fa uh, family is key. And Ronaprif should be given to patients who have got COVID-19. And what can you do? I think we've just shown that public health measures work and that's what you should continue doing. Um, I think the other important thing is to reduce other risk factors um, because, the, so for instance, if you think you're overweight or um, uh, you've got type two diabetes, it's very important to start, start living well and try to address all the problems. And look for update information. Obviously education events like this will help you to um, know as much as you can about COVID. And saying that, I would like to thank all the charities involved in survey, all the patients participating in survey, and thank you for all the clinicians who provided um, the cases. Thank you for listening. Hello, my name is uh... Florence Simbalista, and I work in Paris University. And I'm going to give you a short presentation on uh, vaccination and uh, CLL. And uh, I want to uh, keep that uh, talk short. Uh, so um, we all know that uh, CLL is associated with uh, immune dysregulation, which is due to several factors hypogammaglobulinemia, impersonal immunity, and therapy-related immunosuppression. Uh, we, we also know that uh, responses to vaccination are not optimal, and uh, in particular for patients who receive BTKIs. Um, we had, uh, there, are, there were very large uh, vaccine trials that have demonstrated that in general population, this vaccine is very efficient, but uh, the, the immunocompromised individuals were excluded from these trials. So um, the aim of the study that we conducted uh, was uh, to evaluate uh, uh, the antibody response in CLA patient after one, two, and three doses of vaccine. And I must say that we had a tremendous help uh, from the French uh, um, patient association because almost half of the CLA patients who are included in that studies, study uh, came, gave their results by themselves. So we were able to get results from 530 patients. And uh, you see here that uh, the majority of patients received the Pfizer vaccine. Uh, the median age was the one that we see in CLL. There were more males than, than females. And 40% of the patient had never received any treatment. They were treatment naive. And 60% of the patients had either received previous treatment or were on therapy. The results, uh, we were able to get the results after one dose by uh, uh, having a serology the day of the second dose, meaning four weeks after receiving the first dose. And you see here that only 27 of the patients had antibodies after the first dose, which is much, much lower than the general population. And it was about the same for the treatment naive and the patient who were not on therapy anymore, but who had received prior treatment, but it was even lower for patients who were on therapy at the time of vaccination. When we look at the response after two doses, uh, the global results are 52%. For the patients uh, who were treatment naive, they had the highest response rate at 72%, uh, but that is to be compared to about 95% of the general population. And uh, it was a bit lower in the previously treated patients who were not on therapy and who had received mostly chemoimmunotherapy, it was about 60%. Uh, but uh, for the patients who were on therapy, it was much lower. And there was a difference according to the therapy that the patients were receiving. As you see here, for the patients who received BTK inhibitor, uh, they had a very low rate of response but the patients who were receiving venetoclax alone had almost the same response as the patients who were previously treated. The worst was the patients who received anti-CD20 antibody or the patient who had the combination of venetoclax and BTK inhibitor. So we tried to see if there, uh, by multivariate analysis, uh, 
what were the risk factors for the absence of response. And as expected, well, uh, it was uh, the response was less uh, in uh, patients uh, that were over 65 years old, the patients who were on therapy, and the patient who had a low gamma globulin level. Interestingly, the patients who had COVID before getting a first dose of vaccine all responded to vaccine after one dose, and they also were converted with much higher titers antibodies than the patients who receive two doses of vaccines, meaning that the, 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 there is a capacity in the CRL patient of responding, but uh, uh, it, the, the, the vaccine by themselves uh, don't trigger uh, the, the, the response the same way. Well, uh, we were able to conduct this, uh, this uh, study quite quickly. And uh, uh, considering our results, the French Ministry of Health allowed uh, early uh, access to a third dose of vaccine to patients who were seronegative after three, after two doses. And so uh, the results here uh, consider only seronegative patients after two doses who were proposed the third dose. And as you see here, well, among these seronegative patients, 35% were able to uh, mount a response after the third dose. And interestingly, there are obviously two categories of patients. The one who had a very low response after, uh, but not completely negati negative. They were just uh, below the, the title that was considered as positive. Most of them were able to have a, a response, whereas patients who had really no antibody did not get any benefit from the third dose. So uh, what do we know also about COVID in the patients who are vaccinated? Well, we, we, we don't have enough information because uh, most of the patients uh, were not registered, but uh, we were able to, to, uh, to collect 12 cases of early post-vaccination COVID among patients who received two doses. And it is largely underestimated because these are only some hospitalized patients that we were aware of. And it was at the time where there was the, 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 the wave was still on. Uh, right now, there, there are less cases. And among these 12 cases, uh, we have the serology before COVID and after vaccination, and they were all negative. And concerning the therapy, well, six were on BTKI and three on anti-CD20, on, on anti uh, meaning that these are really the patients that we know that have a very poor response to vaccination. But we're also aware of cases who had post-vaccination COVID later on, later uh, uh, after vaccination, and they did not get sick uh, very much, as it is the case right now in the cases that uh, we are aware of in general population. So what are the recommendations? Of course, keep safe with the prevention of contamination. I think it's very important uh, now, uh, uh, which is good, uh, the, 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 the serology in France is reimbursed, because it's important to have a post-vaccine serology for immunocompromised patients, because after those two or after those three, to, uh, for the patients to be aware if they are negative, because they have to protect themselves more, and they also will be eligible for anti-SARS-CoV-2 uh, uh, antibody prophylaxis. Um, as doctors, we have also decided to adapt therapy uh, and try to vaccinate all our patients before initiation of therapy. And if possible, uh, during the pandemics, uh, avoid anti-CD20 antibodies. And uh, um, we, we, we are aware that there are better responses to vaccination for patients who receive anti-CDCL2 uh, uh, as compared with PTKIs. So that might uh, uh, wait in uh, the choice of treatment. So just a, a few words on uh, three different uh, anti-COVID antibodies that uh, we, we have or we are going to have. Well, there's a Ronepreve, uh, 
uh, which is a combination of two monoclonal antibody, antibodies, and it's designed to block the infectivity of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, there were trials that showed that it significantly reduced the viral load uh, in patients hospitalized with COVID-19 that, that had not been vaccinated before. And uh, it's also working in early post-exposition prophylaxis. So it's available now for patients who were in contact and uh, for uh, patients at er with early infection and uh, it's uh, right now it's limited in terms of uh, uh, primary prophylaxis. There are two others that are coming uh, and maybe some others that I'm not aware of, but these are the ones that we are going to have in France quite, uh, quite soon. Uh, there is, uh, AstraZeneca has developed uh, an antibody uh, with the same uh, studies than the Ronapriv. Uh, but what's interesting is that antibody has been modified in order to, to provide a long lasting protection. And uh, this antibody might be injected only every six months and even maybe only once a year to provide protection. And that's really the one that we are waiting for because the Ronapriv has to be uh, administered every four weeks. And uh, uh, this antibody is also uh, um, working against the Delta variant. But then I, there's another one who is uh, developed by GSK and uh, who has a, a slightly shorter uh, half-life that might be injected every three, we, uh, three months or maybe six. And there is a pilot study which is uh, uh, starting soon uh, with pharmacokinetics. Uh, uh, to see if uh, it's feasible on a primary prophylaxis. And uh, for all these anti-COVID antibodies, the eligibility will be based on the fact that the patients are, are seronegative after three doses of vaccine. So there are uh, ongoing, uh, an active ongoing research where there are these three antibodies cocktails uh, and that we'll soon have in primary prophylaxis, and they, there will certainly be others. Uh, there are several groups that are exploring the T cell immunity, the memory T cells and the memory B cells also, that may allow to mount a response in seronegative patients. There is a very recent report saying that there is a, uh, the possibility of mounting a response even if you are seronegative. And uh, we are trying to collect as much cases of COVID post-vaccination to understand uh, what's happening. So I'll be happy to answer uh, all your questions. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Valevska and uh, Professor Simbalista. And now we have the, the whole uh, landscape and the focus on the vaccine uh, efficiency. Uh, well, uh, I urge the audience to ask questions. Well, the, the topic uh, is quite interesting, I guess. And uh, I'm sure you have, as a patient advocate, a lot of issues uh, about this COVID uh, situation for our CLL patient community. So uh, I will try and, uh, pr well, prioritize uh, the, the, the question from the audience. And I have three of them so far. Uh, well, let's say it's not enough. Please uh, ask questions. Uh, and uh, perhaps I could uh, start with the first one to, prof to uh, Dr. Walewska. I, I read the question, post-COVID, what do you think the role for chemoimmunotherapy will be? Will patients continue to receive targeted therapies first? I guess this question is addressing uh, the, 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 well, the, the side effect or the consequences of virus uh, on uh, different types of uh, therapies. Thank you, Pierre, um, and thank you, organizers, for um, inviting me to this exciting session. Um, so I think chemotherapy has uh, obviously gone a long way, and has we've, we know a lot about chemotherapy. I think in a second-line um, treatment, so for patients who relapsed, I don't think really chemotherapy has got much choice. Um, 
uh, and certainly since venetoclax rituximab been approved in the UK, um, so that's well over two years ago, I have not given to any of my relapse patients chemoimmunotherapy. Um, however, in a front line, um, I think this, the place is still there. I mean, if we can remove, obviously, COVID out of the equation, because I think that's what the question is about. So if, if we've got a patient who is very young with very good prognostic um, uh, uh, factors for CLL, um, I think chemoimmunotherapy in this extremely well-selected group, it might be still um, an option because we know from um, MD Anderson data that basically FCR um, can cure some of those patients. So they can be in remission for sort of 20, 30 years. We obviously, we don't see that we don't have enough data for targeted therapy. We don't know whether um, the netoclax combination will reproduce. We don't just don't, simply don't have enough follow-up. Um, so we can't just assume that um, a combination of targeted therapy um, will reproduce the same of what chemotherapy achieved in a certain group of patients. Also, I mean, the other thing to add, we've, I think what it's important now in CLL, we've got choice and it's just so important. We, we had shared decision-making and, you know, we've got truly so many different tools to adjust to the patient, what the patient really, really want. And and I think the chemo, chemo immunotherapy will be part of that choice for very, very selected patients. So, so I wouldn't completely um, scrap chemo immunotherapy just yet. Um, I mean, if you ask me that question again, maybe in um, 12 months, two years time, um, I have something different. But I would say um, it, it's, still, it's still a pretty good option. But it's, it's obviously the, the group of four patients, it's getting quite reduced by now. So we have the appointment, uh, <laughs> doctor. Uh, the second question, which uh, is, to my point of view, uh, mm -hmm. a very difficult one, uh, I will address to Professor Simbalista. Uh, I, I read the question. Since we are an international organization, we should conduct surveys outside uh, of Europe and the USA. It would be nice to compare the vaccinations to not all countries got the Pfizer vaccine. I mean, uh, we see, uh, I think uh, the, the, the question is coming from, uh, from uh, uh, extreme east and uh, I understand uh, fully uh, what, what, they, what they can feel huh? uh, because they don't have uh, the same choice uh, as, we, as we have. Uh, Professor Simbalista, I know you are in, involved in uh, international uh, uh, clinician communities such as IWCLL. What do you think about that? Could, 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 could surveys as uh, the one you, you made in France uh, could be preceded in other countries and especially in countries where uh, the uh, ARN messenger uh, vaccine are not available? Okay, well, <clears throat> first, uh, thanks for the invitation. And I, I want to say that uh, I am completely in agreement with what my colleague said before um, about the treatment. Uh, f considering this, uh, the survey that we had in France, it was already difficult in France for um, <clears throat> financial reasons because uh, you know that uh, uh, the participation of the uh, um, patient association would be a major asset for this study, uh, because patients in some cases have uh, accepted to pay for their test. And I think that it's just impossible to uh, be able to have uh, uh, the, the type of survey without serology. And uh, serology in most countries were not reimbursed. And I think it's very difficult uh, for them for that reason already and also because you know uh, organizing of, uh, on legal and the legal aspects of organizing uh, uh, a survey on many countries uh, make the survey almost impossible because it was kind of an emergency uh, to, to get the results because once the patients are vaccinated uh, if you don't get the result the month after I mean the, the, the information is lost so um, I think that uh, I'm, I'm always very keen on uh, trying to have international uh, data, but for 
this case, I think it's extremely difficult. Um, now, uh, it would be very interesting to compare if people were able to conduct the same type of uh, surveys in different countries. That would be very interesting to compare the results. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, well, there is a, a, a similar question, perhaps. Can you see a role for antigen testing for COVID in CLL patients? I think you, you already answered this question uh, in, your, in your lecture. Um, but, uh, well, it you depends if the, if the question is really antigen or antibody. Well, the, the question is antigen, but I guess it is, uh, it is antibody. Well, well um, I think that... Uh, Antibody testing, I mean, serology is a major point for the, for the, uh, the follow-up of the patients uh, because you really need to know uh, the, the, if they responded or not to the vaccination. And without the serology, you have no idea because we have, uh, uh, through our survey, we have seen patients who were stage A CLL, very stable stage A CLL, who had absolutely uh, no antibody response to two or three doses. And we have seen patients who had been previously treated, who were, for example, even on venetal clax, and who had a good response. So, uh, I mean, it's not the type of uh, treatment in CLL that uh, allows to uh, to um, <clears throat> conclude the, the type of response. Of course, when you have BTK inhibitor or anti-CD20, you know that your chances of responding is very low. But um, otherwise, I mean, uh, without the serology, we just don't know what we're doing. And that's why we have pushed very much in France for reimbursement of uh, the serology and uh, finally we got it. Okay. Uh, may I emphasize that... Uh... It was a, a, a joint effort, a joint lobbying from the clinicians and the patient association in France to make it possible to get this reimbursement yeah. of the antibody testing. Yeah? So, I mean, it's a, it's a huge advantage that we have. Uh, well, a, a question to, uh, to Dr. Valenska probably. Um, uh, what if a patient is on clin clinical trial with venetoclax and CD20 Binutuzumab. Is CD20 cancelled or can the patient refuse to take CD20? I guess it has with uh, something to do with, with COVID for sure. Yes. Um, so obviously um, clinical trial, I mean, that, that basically COVID almost um, destroyed our research and clinical trials and you can, you know, we're still suffering um, from impact from COVID and the obviously recruitment is, is being uh, dramatically reduced. So I mean, quite a lot of clinical trials during COVID were abandoned or put on hold and um, the investigators were very um, kind of trying to be proactive and adjust to what's happening um, rather than what it's written in the protocol. So it's really all depends on a clinical trial and it's really all depends on on um, uh, principal and chief investigators um, who are running those trials. Um, I mean, obviously, this will affect that because if we're talking quite a lot of patients removing obinotuzumab um, from venetoclax, you know, it would be uh, would be quite a quite a big impact on an outcome. And trying to do stats on that, it's very tricky. But yeah, I mean, it raises the problem um, from the data we've seen by Professor Simbalista. You know. It, it, the CD20 basically obliterates the vaccine response. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it is very, um, very difficult uh, decision, especially, you know, I mean, with, with at least as, as for the patient, we know that venetoclax monotherapy has got a place. So I, I wouldn't worry about too much about the effect on the actual CLL. I think, you know, we there is probably only one trial, uh, which was fairly recently published in blood, when they were looking at venetoclax monotherapy versus venet the venetoclax rituximab um, therapy. And there is not much difference. So I think as far as your treatment for CLL, I don't think you should worry that it's compromised. I mean, basically you 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 are entering sort of unplanned clinical trial well unplanned non well a unplanned pandemic trial um, and it's basically the situation is forced upon us uh, what needs to be done so i think as per cll don't worry about it um, i think you know venetoclax will give you decent remission um, for clinical trial that's a disaster 
because suddenly the power of study, however many patients we need to enter, um, you as a case likely to be excluded. Okay. Very, very worrying this uh, situation with clinical trials, of course, but I hope we will uh, we get rid of this pandemic, but I'm not sure it will come so so soon. <laughs> Another question uh, in Facebook. So, I mean, we know all that uh, Facebook can bring some uh, silly informations, but in Facebook groups read that some patients on watch and wait without any therapy after vaccination against COVID have had to start therapy against CLL. So perhaps a question for, uh, for Florence Simbalista. Do vaccination uh, induce uh, early treatment for CLL uh, patients, really? <laughs> oh, no, I mean, uh, vaccination <coughs> has to be done before starting a treatment. That's uh, the important point. I mean, uh, what we have done uh, in, in France uh, and in other countries is uh, uh, when you need to treat a patient with CLL, it's, it's very rarely an emergency. So what we do is that we postpone the treatment until the vaccination is effective, uh, if it's going to be effective. And uh, so, and we start uh, the, 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 the treatment once the patient is vaccinated. But uh, it never happened that uh, uh, vaccination will, would, uh, uh, would uh, accelerate CLL, if, it, if that was the question. <clears throat> uh, the only thing I can say is that uh, it happened, and even in patients who had no CLL, that uh, when you have the vaccine, you can get a, a lymph node, uh, an axillary lymph node on the same side, but that's nothing to do with uh, uh, acceleration of CLL. I think it was important to state that because uh, I guess that the question was more or less uh, whether the, the vaccination could induce uh, CLL uh, progression, uh, which is not the case. Thank you. Uh, another another uh, question uh, for both of you, uh, I guess. Uh, yesterday we had news. I thought you, you, uh, Florence, you, you, you uh, uh, elaborate a little bit about uh, monoclonal antibodies. But the, the next question, of course, is yesterday we had news that a new antiviral drug was approved in the UK for the vulnerable who, who contract uh, COVID-19. What role is it likely to play in improving outcomes for the immune uh, compromise if they contract the disease? And will it be made widely available? Uh, I, I read indeed that uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, treatment has been approved uh, in the UK. So perhaps, uh, first of all, uh, Dr. Uh, Walewska and then uh, Florence. Yeah, so um, yeah, as, um, as um, list, one of the uh, listeners at delegates, thank you very much for posing this question. So this is quite a breakthrough, basically, announcement because it's, it's first, um, it's called Molnupiravir. Yes. Um, so I just, <laughs> I just needed a bit of a prompt. Um, so this, <laughs> this is... Yeah, yeah, so, it was difficult for me either. That reason why I didn't name it. <laughs> but the other name is Lagevrio. Mm. So this is a drug which. Uh, so it's again, it's like with pandemic, things change day by day. So this is a, a phase. So this is a pre preliminary data from phase three studies, which surprise, surprise, has not been pub even published yet. When it gets published, it gets through very strict peer review. So bear that in mind. So all that fantastic news might not be so fantastic in the next few five days because they might, you know, peers, um, when they go through, you know, with a, with a tooth comb through the data, they might find few problems with that study. But anyway, so far, the press release of that study, it's, it's mm -hmm. quite impressive. Um, so, and that's why MRI, MHRA, so this is the UK medicinal agency, has approved use um, of this oral medication. So this is a, um, so it effect, affects how virus replicates. So it's a first uh, proper treatment, well, um, oral treatment for COVID-19. So this was for a mild to moderate um, COVID-19 infections. Um, and it's been authorized in the UK for people over than 60 with diabetes, um, with heart disease and obesity. So yes, I would imagine it would be widely available. And it, I would imagine it should be available outside hospital setting because obviously that's what was tested on people um, 
uh, who were not uh, hospitalized and what it showed it just reduced the number mm. of people to uh, which are hospitalized so and but this is not a specific well this is basically recycled influenza drug so this drug has not been designed specifically for covid-19 there is something else coming somewhere near you <laughs> which is a Pfizer oral mm. medication Very which lovely. is a proteasome inhibitor mm. um, so this was done on epic study so it's called epic uh, in high risk patient so um, and so and this this drug and we don't know obviously how much um, that drug will cost so the um, Molna Piravia, it's going to cost about $700. So you just basically take for five days. Um, the Pax COVID, uh, we don't know, we don't know how long it's, how much it's going to be. And obviously we don't know of the approval just yet, but watch the space. I think this one, the, which was, um, uh, the study was run by Pfizer. Um, that's coming. Uh, very shortly, so this this should be quite exciting. So, and that was specifically designed against COVID nineteen, and actually shown preventing some data. So, with the first one, molnupiravir prevented seven deaths. Um, so, so people who were on placebo, um, seven uh, in in the trial died, uh, whereas any patients who were on molnupivir didn't. And similar with the Pfizer oral medication prevented eight deaths. So I think this is really exciting. So obviously the availability of vaccination was amazing news. And I think we're just um, witnessing another huge milestone in pandemic. Okay, thank you very much. I, I, I guess we have to switch uh, to the panel discussion. Nevertheless, uh, two words about that, uh, Florence, uh, your opinion. No, I fully agree. I think that's important to bear in mind that COVID has changed their, uh, the way uh, we, we usually work and that uh, we sometimes have the surprise to see press release before any information, uh, any scientific information uh, is released to, to the professionals. And uh, so, um, I mean, uh, we sometimes it has... Uh, it, it, you have to be just reasonable and, and wait a little bit uh, to make sure that it's really a breakthrough because it happened last year already with some other drugs that uh, finally it was nothing. But these drugs are certainly had more time, I mean, to be tested and uh, are certainly promising. So I'm not saying it's a breakthrough. I'm just saying, just be, let, let us be cautious a little bit, but that's all. Okay, so let's uh, wait and see, but not too long, hopefully. So we, we will now switch uh, to the panel discussion. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Valevska and uh, Professor Simbalista for your uh, brilliant presentations and for the open-minded uh, discussion. We will now open for 30 minutes uh, the panel discussion and uh, may I introduce now uh, two, uh, three uh, well-known uh, patient advocates, uh, Jennifer Nadal Wilson, Senior Information Specialist at the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, LLS in the USA. Uh, well, uh, she edits uh, disease material for LSL, LLS as well as for other organizations. So uh, she is well uh, concentrated on, the, on these uh, uh, leukemia and lymphoma. Lorna Warwick, uh, hi Lorna. Uh, Lorna Warwick is the CEO of the Lymphoma Coalition, the global uh, umbrella uh, association uh, dealing with all kinds of uh, lymphoma. Uh, well, it's a pleasure to, to, welcome, uh, to welcome Lorna because Lorna was chair of the uh, steering committee of CLLAN and uh, I had the, the honor to be her uh, vice chairman. So thank you, Lorna, for, for joining this, uh, this discussion. And then uh, Mark uh, Oakland, chair of treaties at uh, Chronic Lymphocytic Leukemia Support Association. Uh, CLL support uh, in the uh, UK. Uh, he ensure the activities and meet the needs of CLL community and uh, in line, of course, with uh, charity uh, legislation. Uh, thank you all for joining this discussion. Uh, the, the goal is to exchange between the, 
the, the patient advocates and the clinician about the situation, which is, uh, as you know, uh, evolving uh, extremely rapidly with uh, new uh, information coming along. And also uh, a, a strong evolution of the situation, uh, unfortunately not in the right direction at the moment, because we, have, we see in many countries increase of contaminations. And I will uh, start uh, if he, if he uh, agrees with Mark. Uh, mm. Mark, how do you evaluate the situation? Uh, uh, how uh, the patient, and especially the immune depressed patient uh, having CLL, can cope with the present situation, situation with contamination uh, increasing, with perhaps uh, safety barriers, uh, not respected as well as uh, formerly, and perhaps also some uh, government decision uh, uh, that uh, that uh, free uh, that the, the free the, the the life of people. But uh, what about we CLLs, Mark? Yeah. Thank you, Pierre. Yes, um, mm. it's very very challenging at the moment. Uh, uh, first of all, I want to say thank you for CLLAN and the Horizons team. So far, it's been a fantastic conference, lots of information, lots of great conversations there. And for the smaller charities like us uh, in the UK there, some sort of solace that we're not alone. <laughs> the problems you're facing are faced worldwide to, to a certain degree. And certainly in the UK, the messages we're getting from the members of CLL support is they are more stressed than ever, many of them, because at the, at the height of the pandemic, at least they had the comfort of everyone shielding, everyone locked down, everyone wearing masks, washing their hands, keeping their distance. And suddenly the government in the UK, uh, uh, with relief, I think, announced the miracle drugs that were making it safe for everyone to go outside, which uh, we know from the early evidence is not true. For the immunocompromised, there's a, a a high variance in uh, antibodies, depending what drugs uh, you've taken. And even if you've got antibodies, the data isn't there yet to say whether that's uh, safe to go out, safe to stop sh shielding. So uh, I, I really enjoyed Zach's presentation yesterday about evidence-based lobbying. And I feel sorry for the specialists. You know, I, I talk closely with Renata. We work closely with Renata and the team at CLL Forum. And until we've got the evidence, until they've got the data, it's very hard to advise members what is safe, what is the solution here, until the research is done. So we're still constantly telling people to shield, to mask, to take precautions there. But of course, many of the people are working. So we get calls from people asking what are their rights? Uh, so we can give them some advice in the UK under employment rights, cancer, is a uh, disability recognized there. So they've got rights to talk to their HR, their, 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 their bosses and see what can be done about flexi working, home working, shielding. But we do get cases of bosses that aren't sympathetic and pressing people to go back to work in shops, to, to teach large groups without any protection in there. So it is a very stressful time at the moment. And until the evidence comes through, as to what the solutions and what the, the ways forward are, it's going to remain stressful. And we're encouraging people to shield as much as possible. Okay. Uh, is it uh, the same advice that the two clinicians are giving their, to, their, to their CLL patients? Yeah, well, <laughs> for myself, uh, what I'm, 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 of course, uh, I'm giving it advice to to shield the, uh, the the patients, but still, I think it's almost two years, and people need to live. And um, <clears throat> I think that uh, I would advise to know the the antibody status because uh, you know um, we have to go back to uh, seemingly normal life. And uh, uh, once you are vaccinated, uh, you must, uh, you also have some memory cells and that uh, will allow, and it's, uh, there are studies going on uh, showing that probably even patients who did not have an antibody response might have a memory um, 
cells that allow them to uh, get some defense against the virus. So they might have COVID after vaccination, but they might have a mild COVID. And uh, I think that the antibodies, the, the, the reason why I, uh, I, I spent some time explaining the antibodies is that we have these antibodies handy if a patient is, uh, is contact. And uh, if, uh, if a patient has a uh, positive PCR and anybody, any patient who is a contact or uh, has a positive PCR can receive these antibodies that will prevent from having uh, severe COVID. So um, I think it's really something to take into account. Of course, I understand fully that the patients are stressed to uh, go back uh, into an unshielded world uh, because uh, I think that uh, on that topic, we have been quite reasonable in France because in all places uh, where there are people, uh, everybody is wearing a mask, and I know it's not the same in uh, every country. So um, it's very difficult to answer for everybody. Dr. Walewska, so, is it the same situation in the UK? Uh, well, what, what is the advice? You, we, we, see, we see Mark uh, uh, stressing, uh, uh, dealing with uh, stressed uh, patients. Uh, that is absolutely understandable. Um, what, what, what is your advice? As a, as a clinician, I mean. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously we, you know, we exhausted by pandemic by now, you know, it's two years, how long can it go? But it's, unfortunately, it's, it's, it's part of our life. And I don't think it's, it's, it's not going to go any, any time soon. And I think we stuck with it. Um, probably in some co for some form of coronavirus um, for probably years to come because the, the way we are connected as people globally. Um, so it was just a disaster waiting to happen. And obviously MERS, you know, because MERS happened so far in the country, far, far away, it kind of, you know, it, well, in Europe, we're happy, we're fine. We, you know, so I think we should have, obviously, it's a shame that we didn't take lessons from MERS, but South, South East Asia has learned that. And I think, well, there was a publication from South Korea that people wearing actually wearing masks were uh, you know their, their protection was up to night re reduced of infection up to 93.5 percent um, social distancing was 64 percent if you combine that both it's 98 percent reduction and I've got to say I'm so frustrated, you know, my, our ward um, here in hospital getting fuller and fuller with the COVID cases, why our government will not endorse, you know, it's so simple, just get everyone, put the, those masks on. It's just what, just made, you know, just, you know, I get it, they they trying to, you know, entice voters, oh, there is no pandemic, we're not going to do lockdown. But, you know, see what's happening. You know, the cases are going down, you know. So, no, later we probably end up with another lockdown. What do I rather have? A lockdown or wearing masks all the time? Well, <laughs> you choose. <laughs> so, well, anyway, okay. that's my that, that's my okay. sort of um, uh, bugbear a little bit. But so I got patients constantly. And I've got to say, you know, it really goes back to the fantastic sessions we, we had last night, the unshared decision making. Mm. And very frequently, and I've, you know, I find it quite difficult because the very frequently, not only patients, some, I'm not saying all, some patients want me as a clinician to tell them, yeah, it's go, out, it's okay to go out for a, to to watch the football match. <laughs> yeah. No, I can't tell you that that it's okay. It's so, a, it's a so again, you know, I mean, I just say, so how much do you miss that full? You know, so I go to, you know how avid football fan that person is. So I said, okay, so you're sitting in a football match. People are screaming and shouting around you. There are two, three people behind you, less than two meters apart, and screaming and shouting. Do you know the, the vaccination status? Do they have it tattooed on a forehead? No. <laughs> oh, I'm going to wear a mask. Yes, but they don't. Oh, I'll have a shield. Yes, but there are holes in there. You're going to breathe that air in. Okay, well, you know, let's, you know, if you, are you desperate to go for that match? Is it, you know, by be, make, you know, may, be aware that you might get that COVID. Yes, as I mentioned in my, in my presentation, not everyone 
with hematological malignancy end up in hospital because we know those severe cases who do end up in hospital. So that means that it's a severe COVID case. It's, a, it's over 30% mortality. You know, that, that it's a third. It's a lot. Um, okay. you, you know, so I think, you know, I, I think it just kind of, you need to, you know, I end up breaking down. And the other frustrating thing I've got, okay, there is the Department of Occupational Health, those patients to go occupational health. And occupational health wants me to write a piece of paper on the letter that, yeah, okay, this patient is safe to go to work. It's their job, not mine. And this is my another frustration. So, you know, you know, we're talking about shared decision making and what we're doing exact opposite clinician making because well let, let's make this clinician so I, you, i'm being back very probably annoying for that very person because i'm being back very vague could you please consider beliefs motivations risks of this patient also risks of the work and apply to the patient because ultimately that's what they should do Mm -hmm. Yes, the, I can only tell you, yes, this patient is at risk of getting COVID. So, but on the other hand, we all are. I mean, none of us are safe. Yeah, I mean, lucky I escaped and, and managed not to have a COVID yet. But, you know, I'm just waiting to hit me, you know, at, and I don't think the one, you know, everyone of us will get through COVID. It's just the question is when and how bad it's going to be. How, yes. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Jennifer, what about the America, uh, American situation? Um, so America now has opened up. So now we're letting many people in from all over the world again. We have, I believe it's 58% of the United States is fully vaccinated. And they recently just approved the 5 to 12-year-olds getting vaccinated, so hopefully that will help a bit. Um, but there's tremendous reluctance of parents for the children to be vaccinated. I think they said 63% aren't going to do it. The actual um, vaccine, um, it, who, who, you know, I know that the way that we're going to get move forward with this is for everyone to be vaccinated. And in the United States, it has become a very political decision. Like so, so many people are just saying, I'm not going to do it. You know, I don't want to do it because I have my rights. I have my freedom, um, which is incredibly frustrating. I can tell you, though, that of the people I speak to, I, you know, we speak to all blood cancer patients. I, it has, in the last year and a half, very rapidly moved to a much higher percentage of CLL patients. <coughs> CLL patients absolutely, for the most part, were very anxious to get vaccinated, were anxious to be in get the booster and we have a disease registry where we are monitoring people's antibody response. And we've had over 8,000 people join. And I think the majority of them are CLL patients because we need this information and we need to know who's protected and who isn't. And the thing I would just also say is we've, I, I feel like in my role of talking to individuals, one of the biggest concerns is like, how am I going to say to my family member, I don't want to come to your Thanksgiving, or people um, like Dr. Walewski sa said, you know, they want us to tell them it's okay to go to Thanksgiving with, you know, a group of 30 people in an indoor closed space and they say, well, can, I haven't seen my grandchildren. Can I go see them? And I can't be in that position. I'm, I'm you know, I, I just can't. And so it's, it's, these are very difficult conversations of trying to help people and educate them, but it's hard. <coughs> okay. Lorna, uh, you are in a position where you can uh, observe the, 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 
the, the wide world, so to say. Uh, what is uh, your, your advice? Uh, what should the uh, patient association and patient advocate do in this uh, very stressed, uh, st uh, scary uh, situation uh, for, for the patient, for sure, but as well for the clinician, as we saw? So I do think, right, we know COVID is in flux. So if we're looking around the world, there were countries that thought they had it in hand that are now seeing a rapid rise in cases again. And so really, um, for our patient organizations, you have to address the situation within your country. And so you're looking at what is actually happening and what is the best that we can do for patients in that case. And yes, that is often shielding and masking and, and recommendation of vaccines. Though I will point out that not everybody in the world currently has access to good quality vaccines. And so and that is an issue that needs to be addressed if we're going to actually globally handle this situation as we move forward. As well, though, cultural issues come into play. So we, I know Renato is talking about Korea and the masking, but masking in Korea is quite socially acceptable, right? So you see lots of places in Asia that have been masking long before COVID hit. Can I just jump in? It's yes, socially okay. expect, expect, acceptable because of a MERS, because of the yes. first yes. coronavirus vac epidemic. Yes. We need to make it socially acceptable. Yes. And I think what is fantastic that, you know, some, some sort of uh, designer thinks you can have a matching masks to your outfit. And, you know, all the makeup stuff, think how much money you're going to save. You don't need lipstick anymore. Sorry for interrupting. That's okay. You need it for Zoom calls, though, I find. Anyways, um, with the masking, though, where it is culturally acceptable, they have not necessarily had the same issues we're seeing in other parts of the world where people for some reason are thinking that this is a violation of their rights, that they have to put this piece of cloth over their face. And that actually comes from a place of privilege, right? So that you, you've been lucky enough thus far to live in a country where you haven't faced the, the illness that we've seen in other parts of the world. But we should be learning from those countries that have had that success. So if we go back and we look at those organizations that coped with earlier pandemics or earlier uh, mass disease in their country, what happened to precipitate that switch? Is patient education enough? And what was that actually, um, what was actually involved in that? I do think we need to go back and do a little bit more with those uh, organizations, with those countries, so we can learn from them and see if there's a way we, we can have some further encouragement. I will say, though, political reasons are, are massive for what we're seeing right now, right? So our governments are focused on their next election, and we know that a lot of people are just really tired of being at home, and so they're basing decisions not based on, on science. And that is awful. Right. So really, I know that um, people want to be out, but there are things we can do to be safer while we're out and back out in our communities and reengaging with our family and friends. Thank you, Donna. Um, Florence, you, you wanted to intervene. Yeah, it's just to make a little balance because there is another situation that should not be underestimated is that I have seen more elderly patients who have been totally isolated for almost two years and uh, who are absolutely uh, stressed about uh, seeing anybody. And I think that we also there to make a balance because, uh, of course, the patients who are not reasonable and want to go to football mask, we have to, uh, to ask them not to do it. But the patients who haven't even seen their grandchildren for two years and have completely depressed, I think that we also have to explain that there can be some reasonable social life going outside with them, not being in uh, uh, being uh, in open air, wearing masks, asking for before family reunion to, to be tested, uh, vaccinated and tested. And I think that uh, uh, we also have, because we're, it's not stopped. I mean, COVID is still there and uh, there are patients who are completely at loss. Can I just add, I completely agree. 
And what I'm not suggesting is that, you know, um, everything has to be locked down again. But I do think there has to be some regulations coming into play. We see cancer patients that are getting confronted because they're wearing a mask when it's not a mask mandate mm -hmm. because they think that, you know, they're sheep following what, what uh, um, I don't know what they think they're doing. Um, so they're getting confronted and they're getting negative reactions uh, against them just because they're wearing a mask. But that is the best thing for our patients to do. They shouldn't feel like they're going to be stigmatized when they go into a community because they, they need to wear a mask and they need to ask questions about vaccination status of other people or, you know, checking to make sure that it's a safe environment for them to be. And, and there is another problem is that some patients and many patients with or without uh, uh, hematological malignancies have pre we did not go to the hospital for uh, almost a year and a half. And what we see actually in the hospital is patients who should have been treated for the disease for uh, many months and who didn't go because they were afraid of going to the hospital. So we also have to deal with that. And uh, because all our colleagues in the cardiologists, the pneumologists and our uh, gastroenterologists, they are just... Uh, they, they see awful things uh, because people have been uh, so close in that uh, so locked down that uh, uh, there are some uh, medical problems that have been uh, not been uh, um, treated. Yes, Lymphoma Coalition for for World Lymphoma Awareness Day this year started a campaign called "We Can't Wait." which is exactly based on that, encouraging patients if they have any new symptoms, if, if, um, if symptoms have advanced, that they reconnect with their doctors and make sure they're not missing any of their appointments yeah. and getting hospital back into care. I mean, uh, yeah. hospital is safe. In yeah. most countries, yes. 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 In, in UK, it's mandatory to wear a mask in a hospital. And we all test it as well. So yeah, the, although hospitals were not very safe at the beginning, but I think with pan, current current say safe pandemic, probably the, the safest place because, to be. Uh, so uh, in in my patients, I must say that I have been seen much more of patients who were isolated than patients who are not reasonable. I mean, about ninety. We have we had a look, but I think that ninety five percent of my patients are vaccinated which doesn't mean that 95% are protected, but uh, at least they are more on the safer side. And, uh, and I think that uh, the, the, the problem of uh, getting them back to a possible life is important. I agree. Okay. Uh, I, I, we are approaching the end of this session, unfortunately, highly interesting. Thank you uh, to all. Uh, we have two remaining questions. Uh, if you can answer, try and, and answer extremely quickly, uh, uh, a question triggered by Renata's statement of making masks socially acceptable. Is there any patient organization lobbying political decision makers on getting the right policy in place? If there is, then this would be a great case uh, we all co could learn from. Second question, do the panel think our governments have let our patient community down? Well, let's say uh, uh, my, my, my feeling uh, is that we have a lot of improvement with vaccine, with uh, uh, monoclonal antibodies, with the treatment per perhaps coming soon. Uh, I mean, for the for the healthy countries, for the other countries, it's another issue that we have to deal with for sure. But I have the feeling that the the governments, uh, at least some governments, are not inf are not uh, uh, putting uh, the the right uh, effort uh, on uh, convincing people to 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 to, to continue having these safety precautions, such a mask, uh, etc. So, I mean, uh, it's, uh, it's unfortunately too late. We have to, we have to, 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 to go to an end uh, of its, this session. It's a pity because we have a lot of uh, other uh, issues that uh, could have been dealt with. Uh, thank you very much to the two clinicians. Thank you very much for the three, um, three uh, patients advocate. 
we learned a lot. We have now the, the, full, the whole landscape about uh, COVID and CLL. We know how uh, efficient uh, the, the vaccine could be. We, we have some perspective of, uh, of treatment of any kind. And uh, we see that we, as a patient organization, have a lot to do in order to, to advise uh, our, our, our patients and we see that there is always a balance, uh, a balance between uh, risks and, uh, and uh, quality of life, so to say. Huh? And that is, uh, as, uh, as uh, it has been uh, stated uh, for sure, uh, and that must be uh, a shared, uh, shared uh, decision making between the clinicians that can give an advice, the government that gives some rules, and the people themselves uh, who have to decide about their own future, but well knowing what, what, what the risk could be. So thank you very much. Uh, I uh, think we have a 25 minute break before the, the next session. Don't uh, leave the, the meeting. I hope we will have uh, a, a very interesting uh, uh, coming session in 25 minutes and enjoy the break in the in the in the meantime thank you very much to all of you thank you